first step What can figure it out That's how it chooses you Hello everybody, welcome to It Chooses You Smidgen Edition Smidgen Edition Ding ding This is just a little bite of pop culture we bring you on Sundays Kind of tied you over for the week Little something delightful that you can pick up, look at, check out and perhaps also be delighted by. Wherever you found this podcast, please like it, rate it, and download it. And we also have a lovely Patreon for you, patreon.com forward slash it chooses you. Our lowest Patreon tier is a dollar a month, and that's going to help us keep the podcast ad free. We're very excited about it, and we hope to see you there. Hey, Teresa, we read a book this week. We read a book this week. We've been looking forward to reading this book Mm -hmm. since we knew it existed. We knew it existed before it came out. That's how excited we were. I feel like we were a little late to the game with the first book in this series, Hollow Kingdom, by Kira Jane Buxton. The delightful, magical, wonderful Kira Jane Buxton. Yeah, we we got to that one long after it had been in paperback. But the benefit of that is that once we read the first one, we were like, oh shit, there's a second one coming out in like a couple months. <laughs> so if you've read or are interested in Hollow Kingdom, we did a smidgen on that book a couple of months back. So check that out. But today we're here to talk about the sequel to Hollow Kingdom, Feral Creatures. I should kind of say up at the top, there's going to probably be some minor spoilers. So if you haven't read the book, maybe you want to skip this one. (laughs) In my little notes for this, I was like, Teresa's going to talk about things. And so there will only be spoilers in this conversation. (laughs) And if you care about being surprised by something when you read it, you should definitely sit this one out, go and read both those books, and then come on back later once you've got them. Yeah, we'll still be here. Don't worry. The episode will still exist. But if you don't care, like me, welcome. (laughs) Let's talk all about it. (laughs) I thought we were just going to stay here until everyone had read the book. And then we'd check back in. Like, we're going to keep recording until they've read it. We'll do a four-month-long episode that's one (laughs) long take of just, like, us in our daily lives not talking about either of the books until you come back and tell us. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. It's called podcast live streaming, and it's the hot new thing. (laughs) <laughs> but it's live streaming of no content. It's like kitchen noises in the background. And like so you can hear somebody come up on the porch and the dogs bark. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this isn't related, but I wanted to tell you so badly because I was thinking of it in, in relation to our fakes episodes. And I think this smidgen comes out after the first fakes episode. But I saw a video on YouTube a, that is a comparison of a border collie doing an agility course and a husky doing an agility course. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and I wanted to talk about that in the context of fakes because the husky is clearly the fake. In this. <laughs> <laughs> so the border collie does it with the single minded, ferocious attention that you come to expect from a herding dog that is, you know, the genius of the canine world. And the husky gets up on this course and literally moseys and is like, hmm, I think I'll do this one now. And he clearly knows how to do the course. He just doesn't give a fuck. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No focus. No, he doesn't care. He's like, yeah, I could, but why? Also, it's really hot in here, you guys. My coat (laughs) is dense. Made me laugh so hard. I loved it so much. That's awesome. The husky is the fake of the agility course world. He's not a good fake. He's clearly a substandard border collie. Substandard border collie, excellent husky. We read this book. I also finished this book yesterday. So still very fresh. This is Kira Jane Buxton's Feral Creatures. It's out in hardback and it's available everywhere. Go to an independent bookstore and make them happy by purchasing a book. Man, is it good. I feel like writing a sequel has got to be really hard Mm. because you want to provide people with the same sort of ethos world and characters that they loved in the first one, but then you've got to kind of deepen and widen the world. It's like a really good sitcom. Yeah. Same but different. And so it's like, how do you up the ante in the second book? How do you raise the stakes? How do you keep it interesting, but also fulfill all those things your readers love? And she fucking nailed it. Yeah. Turns out she's a really good writer. Yeah. You heard it here first. (laughs) The first book was nominated for every prize. Yeah. I noticed it. I was like, oh, I am fully satisfied. Thank you very much. This book is a lot darker, I would say, than the first one, which makes sense in the timeline. Hollow Kingdom is about the human apocalypse. We did an episode on it. We're not going to recap it here. You can go listen to it. But this book sort of picks up in the decade and a half after that experience. And so like noticing the apocalypse and living through the, the tail end of the human species on earth is a different feeling than 
living in the changed world. And so this book is living in the changed world and it's, it's a, a little harder, a little harder, like the super heartbreaking moment in hollow kingdom that killed me and tore me open and made me love it happened almost at the end mm-hmm. of that book. And in feral creatures, it happens before you're a hundred pages in your heart is just destroyed. Yeah. And I, for some reason I was engaging with a lot of stories this week that made me cry mm. and I'm an open person, but I don't find myself overly, you know, prone to crying. And I I got to the end of the book and I just had to go get the tissues from the bathroom. Eventually, like I had gone individually three times Mm. to go get tissues and was like, just get the box. Mm -hmm. You just need the box. I just was like, this is ripping my heart open again in the best way possible. That sort of cathartic healing crying. Mm -hmm. But it had me. It had me in its clutches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's how love. It's the it's the pain of love. It's how love opens your heart, which is it doesn't matter that it's love. It's still incredibly painful. That's why it's painful. This struck me the first time, but it really came home for me this time. How much knowledge there is about the natural world in these books. I really appreciated that. I was like, dang, I didn't know that about voles. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh my gosh, they use echolocation. Who knew? Lots of people, Teresa. <laughs> Lots of people. Just do that. not you, dummy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I I also had a note on the personal. Like I cried a lot more reading this one than I did. And for those of you who don't like crying, I'll just tell you that the thing that breaks your heart in Feral Creatures, it turns out to heal your heart at the end. So it breaks your heart first, and then you go through the rest of the story, and then at the end it comes back and it saves you. It is the solution. Don't worry. She's not irresponsible with our hearts. She is careful with our hearts. She is aware. At the end of Hollow Kingdom, owls in Alaska have found a human baby and are taking care of her, and they send word through Aura, which is the communication system that all land-based creatures are tuned into, as they desire to be, that they need help taking care of this human. They're like, we're fucking owls. We can't do this. We need assistance here. We don't know anything about people, really. And the animal world conspires to get shit turd the hero American crow up there to help because they know how much he misses people. And they also know that he knows what they need. And so ST on Magisi, the bald eagle, he ends up staying in Alaska and raises this human child. And so we sort of catch up with them. He, he does, you know, the time in this book is like the time in the last one. It doesn't pass in standard ways because animals don't ever clock into a job. So they don't, They don't exist in time that way. So the sense of time in the novel is very flexible, which I like. But we catch up with him about 12 or 13 years after. And and all of the animals in the vicinity have been raising this human child, basically. She speaks animal languages. She speaks English because ST taught her. The scenario of raising a child is such a good foil for ST's personality and foibles. His desire to control things, his fear, because the first book centers so much around his fear around protecting Dennis, his bloodhound buddy, his bloodhound brother, really. And this book, it's like, oh, but now he has a child. Mm -hmm. This is going to go, oh, God. And the whole book, he's... He's kind of pissed off at her because she's not doing things the way he wants her to or the way he taught her to. And I found myself a little pissed off at her, too, Mm. and kind of had a similar journey to him. Like, why is she doing this stuff? Oh, oh, she really knows what she's doing. Mm -hmm. She's really cool. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But just raising a child is such a good scenario for his personality to play and screw up and, like, do its thing. Well, and his stance is, fucks your problem. But raising a child and a teenager fucks your problem. If that's your stance anyway, good luck. Good <laughs> yeah. luck. <laughs> yeah. My yeah. problem is you, mom. <laughs> My problem is you, dad. I think what happened for me is there's a moment where she sets a building on fire, which yeah. ends up being a pretty devastating moment that sort of initiates the the journey, right? The story, the adventure. Leaving the nest. Yeah. And she set the building on fire and I was like, oh no. She's going to turn out like us. I was really worried. Mm. I was like, oh, she's going to be me. Mm. Fuck, man. Don't turn into me. I felt that very strongly. Like that worry. To be better than us. Please. Please be better than us. Yeah, I felt that desire too. And so reading about her story, my tension was always, is she going to turn out to be just as stupid as we are? Agreed. Or having the wonderful circumstance to be raised by the natural world in a real and concrete way. Will she please, fingers crossed, turn out better than we are? Will she have a different understanding? Will she make different choices? And don't worry, she does. It's all good. 
it's hard because I want to tell you every single, I want to tell you listeners every single thing about the novel, but I understand that of course you should just read it. So one of the things that is part of the first book, but I found particularly delightful in the second because of that time that's passed and that perspective is the comedic mileage the book gets out of ST explaining humanity to us. Yeah. And the really good jokes that happen because he makes mistakes. And of course, it's such a brilliant trick because we know the truth. We know that he meant to say this, not that. And the example that stuck in my head, he's talking about humans and he said, humans would frequently mate with one person for life. They called it monotony. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm in a monotonous relationship. ST gets a lot of things right. You know, he's a fan of humanity in our culture, but then he does get things wrong that just provides these delightful moments throughout. There's a good balance of humor and emotion. So well balanced. Yeah. And can we talk about the joy when they arrive in Seattle? The joy of all of the reunions that they have. So they've been away. They've been in Alaska for 12 or 13 years. And ST comes back. ST and McGeesey come back and they meet all of <laughs> all of the people we met in the first book and have different relationships with them. And in those reunions, even with people who were very dangerous in the first book, the, t the brothers Burning Bright, right? The three tigers that they fought in the first book. ST watching D take control of that situation. And when the tigers roar at her, she roars back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's like, n n absolutely not. And to watch him as a parent continue to fail to understand that she's onto something that he's not onto, that is so relatable when we think about our own parents or our own children. Like we think we understand them, but then we don't. We miss things because we're so close to them. And so when he's watching her take control of that situation, I was like, why aren't you more impressed? That's a very impressive thing she just did. And you're not more impressed. You're more worried. And I was like, oh, it's because you're a parent. I think this is a good thing. Like I had moments where like, oh, I want to be more like D. Mm -hmm. And I, I know I never will. I can't. You know, I'm limited by who I am and by my circumstances. But I thought, wow, what a great model for relationship to nature. And so in addition to this story, I had this like role model mm -hmm. in a very specific, important thing, which is my relationship to nature. You know, at the end, we find out she's learning animal languages that even ST doesn't know. He didn't encourage her to do that. That's something she has that's her own. And her ability and desire to learn those languages saves them. Like, that's what saves them. And the whole time he was being very judgmental about her and questioning her choices. And it turns out she was 100% right. And to watch him realize it at the end, he calls her a flower at the beginning. He compares her to a flower. She's so beautiful. She's a little flower. And at the end, he says, I was wrong to call her a flower. She's not a flower. She's a fucking weed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she will grow anywhere. She is strong and durable. And she will kick your ass and she will break apart the concrete. And she's that powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Can we please just talk about being reunited with Genghis Cat? <laughs> yes. Yes. It made me so happy. I was like, Genghis Cat's still alive. Hell yes. Oh, it was so good. And he even does get his own chapter, which is great because in the first book you hear from him multiple times. And towards the end, it, it's a really great moment because he's basically shown up to save the day. And he's explaining that he's shown up to save the day in his like typical pompous and his delightfully asshole way. I love when they walk in and ST describes all of these like cats coming toward them. And he's like, oh, Genghis Cat has been busy. And look, most of them inherited his fuck you face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, because this is towards the end of the book, I don't, I don't really want to spoil it too much. But there's a moment where the perspective of the book actually shifts. So beyond just the different animals from all over the world who are telling their stories, the central narrative actually switches perspective. And there are moments there where that other character who's speaking reveals things about ST that we didn't know and would never know. Yes. Potentially because he doesn't know, but we have to remember he's an unreliable narrator mm -hmm. and not in a jerk way. He's willing to be soft about certain things with us, but other things he isn't. And so not only is this a, a moment of suspense that the book creates, but then Buxton 
takes that moment and takes advantage of it to reveal information that we didn't have that gives us more context for ST. And that was one of the moments that I cried a lot because I was like, I didn't know all this about him. Yeah. You know, you spend two, almost two books with someone. You're like, oh, I know him, you know? Yeah, totally. And it was just this very clear ray of sunshine through a dark cloud. We get to know this thing. Suddenly this thing is illuminated and it helps us understand the relationship of the rest of the Seattle murder to ST because we we see it like, oh, oh, okay. And it actually illuminates some shit from the first book, which is awesome. So if this book is mostly about family, I think it's, I mean, I think it's safe to say that this is about what it is to create a new family and what, what family does for each other and what family should do for each other. There's a lot of imperatives in this book that I found really beautiful. All right, that's enough. Okay, you guys go read it. Go read it. We're going to start crying again. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Kara Jane Buxton, for this book. We will see you on the next episode, everybody. Bye. Testing. Great. Thank you for listening to It Chooses You. Your hosts are Teresa Sparks and Claire Patton. Our theme song is by Bobby Dart. If you'd like to get in touch with us, drop us an email at itchoosesyoupodcast at gmail.com. 